morning and a very warm welcome on behalf of the Workers Group of the European Economic and Social Committee to this webinar on the action plan to implement the European Pillar of Social Rights and the Social Summit. My name is Jackie Davis. I will have the privilege of moderating our totally interactive discussion this morning with questions from me to our distinguished panel, but also, I hope, later on from all of you. Uh, if you want to join the discussion, either with a question for our panel or indeed a comment, uh, please, if you're watching on Facebook, use the comment button on Facebook uh, and those questions will be relayed to me or on Twitter. You can also put your question that way and using the hashtag social rights, if you would, please. One request, please, could you keep your questions and comments brief so that I can see at a glance what your question is and who it's for. Could I perhaps suggest Twitter length or less would be terrific. Um, and if you want to share what you're hearing today with the outside world, again, please use the Twitter hashtag social rights. So let me introduce our panel. I'm delighted to welcome Miguel Cabrita, Portuguese Secretary of State for Labour and Vocational Training and Deputy Minister to Ana Mendes Godino, Portuguese Minister for Employment, Solidarity and Social Security. The Minister uh, for Health Reasons had to drop out at the last minute. We are very grateful to Miguel well for agreeing uh, to join us at such short notice. Very delighted to welcome Nicola Schmidt, European Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights, Irache Garcia Perez, who is leader of the S&D Group in the European Parliament, and our host today, Olivia Ropka, Workers Group President in the European Economic and Social Committee. So, as I said, totally interactive discussion, questions from me, then from all of you. Let's jump in. And Secretary of State, if I could come to you first, uh, your presidency has put this issue, the social agenda, as a top priority for your time in the presidency hot seat. What do you see as the most important challenges that we need to address now, particularly in the context of COVID and what that has highlighted uh, about the precarity of some workers' positions, uh, the need for uh, urgent, urgent need for adequate social protection. What do you see as the key challenges that the action plan and the social summit are going to need to address? Well, good morning to you all. Thanks for the invitation. As you said, Anna is not present for health, in fact, COVID reasons. Uh, I'd like to uh, also say hello uh, to Oliver, to Irece, and of course to Commissioner Schmidt. Uh, very briefly, I think that uh, we are in the middle of a COVID crisis, so we have to tackle the immediate issues, but also look at the future. And in this context, the action plan comes at the right time. I think it's an important signal to European citizens. Um, and we will have to be able to uh, face the immediate pressure on health systems. Uh, in every country now, we are trying to meet the challenges of a pandemic as we have not known for um, generations. But it's also the right time to look at the future and to uh, get our instrument, the European pillar, to work and to translate it into real people's lives. So the, the pillar will be very important to uh, send a clear message on the strategy the Europe is together planning uh, to um, try to tackle the social and economic issues that both at present but also for the future we will have to face in order to have a better and more social cohesion and a better quality of life for citizens. I think that employment is a key issue. Uh, not only the dynamism of the labor market in terms of creation of employment but also employment quality uh, we know that in times of crisis, uh, people with precarious short-term jobs are the most affected by the crisis. And we also know that in recovery times, also short-term jobs, not permanent jobs, are the first to be created. But we need to ensure um, that this crisis does not translate in the long term in a lower uh, quality of employment. We also need to look at social cohesion for this reason, because, uh, of course, everybody is at risk in the pandemic, but not everyone is affected in the same way. Different uh, groups of workers, different people, people with different levels of income are uh, are uh, in different levels of risk in terms of the long, medium and long-term effects of the crisis. So social cohesion and social inclusion specifically uh, is also among uh, one of our priorities. Um, 
and I think that uh, in every dimension, employment, inclusion, social cohesion, we need to understand that a pandemic is asymmetric. And so an, uh, an, an action plan, from our view, of course, it's the Commission's instrument, but we know uh, they, they are working to be a very ambitious plan. Um, we have to look at different dimensions of our agenda and find the right instruments to make the European pillar, which in our view is a very good overarching instrument and have specific instruments to develop and put forward an ambitious agenda uh, in, in its different dimensions. So uh, very briefly, I'd say that we need to look at the present, but also not lose sight of the future because this will be an instrument for the next decade. Absolutely. And, and people talking about that Porto Agenda 2030 to be discussed at the Social Summit, perhaps there uh, more a moment to focus on that long term vision and goals and implementation of the social pillar as well as the short. But Commissioner, uh, for you uh, um, and as you said, as the architect of the action plan, uh, the key challenges you see it. Uh, but and would you agree with, with the Secretary of State that it's this combination of the immediate urgent challenge of COVID combined with that longer term vision and agenda that we need to deliver on the social dimension? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, the idea of an action plan was not born with the COVID crisis, uh, nor, by the way, the uh, organization of a social summit, because I remember very well having discussed this with uh, Prime Minister Costa before the crisis. And uh, it's obvious that uh, there was this strong feeling that we had to rebuild something in uh, Europe and that we had to rebuild something in our societies. That with the previous crisis, a lot of things had been broken. And uh, so the social dimension really was uh, on the agenda. And the crisis, the COVID crisis, as the uh, Secretary of State uh, just uh, stressed it, has amplified this and has shown that really there is a need for uh, more social investment, for improving uh, our social services, and for bringing, again, more fairness and justice in our society. And at the same time, we are living, we are going through big transformations. So the big transformations are the digitalization, the change of the world of work. We still are in a globalization which goes on even if, if there have if there has been some uh, there have been some changes there but globalization is not over and therefore i think this is the more longer term trend digitalization the greening of our economy the pressure coming from climate change and in our society we discover that finally as i said a lot of things are broken uh, millions of people are now confronted with uh, poverty, but this has worsened due to the COVID crisis. But the reality before the COVID crisis was not so much better because uh, we had about 100 million Europeans uh, at risk of poverty. This has now increased and this has now also touched uh, people who never thought that they could be uh, in such a situation. And so I think, uh, this is the, the urgency. How can we, and, and finally, I must say, we, we seize the, this terrible opportunity to change a lot in our mindset, to change a lot in our policies. Suddenly, the crisis showed that uh, uh, what we consider to be fundamental principles were finally very relative principles. And the policies we are, we are urged to put into, uh, into uh, uh, practice well, are very far from what we believed uh, in the past. And I, I must say, this is the short term. The longer term, this is how to rebuild now our economies, how to build, uh, rebuild the social fabric. I like very much the expression cho uh, chosen by the uh, Economic and Social Committee, we need a new social contract. Mm -hmm. I think we need a new social contract for the future, because uh, without a social contract, a new social contract, we will not be able either to come out stronger of this crisis, because there are a lot of losers in this crisis, companies and people, we have to admit, and, uh, and, and, and states, because we, we see, as you mentioned now, we, this crisis has also some, everybody shares the, the crisis, but 
there are asymmetric uh, uh, impacts and, and consequences. So this is the big challenge. And I think the Porto Summit will be an important meeting to launch the work on this new social contract and to rebuild our system uh, in order to be to respond to the challenges of unemployment inequality and the big transformations in order to make uh, the world of work not a world where finally technology dominates but where technology helps us a more human-centered technology and uh, that's the big uh, issue uh, at the uh, at the Porto summit uh, to work on this new European social contract. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to um, how we launch that work, how we launch that new social contract uh, in our discussion and, and drill down into some of the detail of that later on. But Irache, uh, from your perspective, um, would you agree that the challenge ahead of us is really to combine these two challenges, the short the long term uh, and what do you think where do you think the focus needs to be if we are to make sure as the commission was saying social dimension uh, was here before covid it was already up the agenda but how do we make sure what are the challenges to really deliver on that now uh, thank you yaki first of all i, I want to, to say to, to thank uh, the invitation to participate in this interest uh, debate and good morning everybody uh, the, the ambition of a strong social Europe uh, has been the, the core political priority for the SD group uh, for decades. But the latest uh, step in this engagement has been the adoption of the European Parliament uh, report on a strong social Europe uh, for just transition, which uh, provides a concrete and ambitious roadmap uh, for the implementation of the European pillar of social rights. This is a key achievement uh, across the EU policies and provides a clear roadmap for the Porto Summit, uh, of course, uh, in May. In the past, uh, the SD group uh, has to lead a battle for the advancement uh, of uh, social rights, uh, gender equality, social justice, and these battles uh, paid off and made uh, a decisive contribution today in the social uh, fabric. Uh, we are uh, starting and the first step with uh, some uh, proposals by the European Commission, for example, the European Child uh, Guarantee, or to the recent uh, Commission proposal for a minimum wage uh, framework. And I think that uh, this is uh, so important uh, for us. And now it is time to transform the 20 principles uh, of the pillar signed by in uh, Gothenburg in 2017 to a concrete action plan with a clear commitment to keep uh, policy proposals. We should not uh, aim for a repetition of uh, Gosenberg in Porto. We need now to focus uh, on the implementation of the pillar for our uh, citizens to feel its added value on their daily lives. We need uh, to translate the European pillar of social rights into a concrete message. If you ask to European citizens most of them don't understand what the pillar of social rights is, uh, but they certainly understand its importance and impact if you create a, a better access of housing, better access to quality health care. We need to translate uh, all these 20 principles into concrete actions mm -hmm. for citizens to understand uh, why it's uh, important. No? Uh, this is what the Porto Summit uh, and the action plan for the pillar should be all about, making the 20 principal reality for every citizen. Uh, we now have a European Green Deal, leg legislative and non-legislative initiative, with a historic agenda of transformation that will reach beyond the boundaries on the ecological, uh, deep into the economic as well as social fabric of our societies. Up to now, the social dimension of the green has uh, only been clearly addressed through the concept of just transition. Yeah. This is important, but it will be not enough. Uh, the technological changes happening in the digital sphere and the multiple repercussion on our economies. Uh, and uh, it's so important to understand that, uh, of course, now uh, the priorities uh, by the recovery has to be the digi digital and uh, green deal, but 
we need to, to, to introduce this social dimension. Why, for example, in the, in the um, legislative measures with the recovery resilience, we could introduce a, a clear objective by the green and the digital, for example, we include in the resilience uh, uh, and recovery fund that uh, it's necessary to spend uh, the 30% the, uh, of this uh, fund in the green and 20 in the digital, but why we could not introduce a, a clear a criteria with the social dimension. Absolutely. And we, we have heard calls uh, indeed, including from uh, the Economic and Social Committee for social progress plans alongside energy plans, uh, recovery plans, climate plans. Uh, how do we do that in practice? And would all of you think that is a good idea? But Oliver, complete the picture for us in terms of the challenge that's ahead. And then I would like to drill down into our conversation. We've already got some questions coming in from the audience. We'll weave those in as we go along. But Oliver, your thoughts on the challenge ahead for both the action plan and the summit itself? Yes, thank you very much, Shaki. Good morning to everybody. Uh, let me just allow me to make one comment uh, at the beginning because I have to say, I'm personally and also the workers group of the Economic and Social Committee is really happy and delighted that at uh, this time, at this terrible crisis, we have such a responsible uh, presidency, uh, EU presidency. I think the targets and the key priorities of the Portuguese presidency reflect very much what we need now in Europe in order to come out of this crisis. So this I wanted to say at the beginning because uh, uh, we really appreciate very much uh, the work program of the Portuguese presidency. I agree with the previous speakers that uh, the idea of the social summit and of the action plan is not a new one. It is true. It was already born before the COVID crisis. And what we can see already before the COVID crisis was a certain shift of paradigm over, over the last years, I would say. So different from previous uh, crises, especially during the financial crisis, uh, there's now a large consensus, I think, uh, that we need a new approach and that we can not leave anyone behind. N uh, no individual persons, but also not uh, uh, some countries. We cannot left behind some countries uh, during this crisis. And uh, I think this is already um, an important lesson we learned from previous crises when we had, um, you know, uh, some medication like so-called structural reforms, neoliberal structural reforms, where in many cases the result was an austerity policy. It was cuts in wages, in social security systems, in pension systems, and so on. So I think this is already a very good signal that we have here a shift of paradigm. And uh, you know that the unions, uh, the trade unions, and also the workers group have always vehemently fought for a totally different approach. So I'm happy that we are now here at this uh, stage. And I think now during this deep crisis, paradoxically, uh, there is a window of opportunity. There is a window of opportunity for a fundamental uh, change of course, also in social policy. And if you ask me what is the main challenge of the Porto Summit ahead, then I think the challenge is really that we have to confirm, that we have to confirm that Europe understands now that there's no economic recovery without a social recovery. And uh, I think we have to confirm this uh, fundamental shift of paradigm in European uh, policy. I think we have to prepare the time after uh, the emergency uh, crisis and the emergency measures during the COVID-19 crisis. So we have, for example, we have triggered the general escape clause from, from stability and growth pact. We have changes in state aid rules. All this is good, but we have to make sure that also after the crisis, we will not go back to business as usual. We have to make sure that uh, social rights will be at the same level and of the same importance than uh, economic uh, freedoms. And therefore, it is of utmost importance for us that we come now from the proclamation of the pillar to action. And I'm really happy that the Commission has launched already several initiatives. Iratje has mentioned them. Um, of course, the minimum wage initiative. And I saw already in the chat there are a lot of questions about poverty. And uh, just to, to, to mention uh, one figure, I mean, 
we have a dramatic increase in in-work poverty in most member states over the last years. Since 2010, in some member states, up to an increase, uh, up to 58% in in-work poverty. So that shows that there is a need for action. And once again, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we tackle now this and we are addressing this. And uh, I expect very much that we will have a concrete roadmap at the Porto Summit and a strong political commitment to this action plan in order to implement the principles of the social pillar in real life that we have really tangible results for working people in Europe. Thank you very much, Oliver. And just, just to follow up on that, in terms of, and the Commissioner referred to and welcomed this phrase you use, a new social contract. What does that mean? What does that contract look like? Is it about the process through which we make sure that this pillar is implemented, uh, that we launch uh, that ambitious agenda? Or is it about the content or is it a combination of the two? What's the key to you uh, to this contract? Same thought from you all, same question to you all about what you think the contract means and why it's so important. Oliver first though, because it's the phrase you came up with. I think it's about both. It's of course about the content. The content is in the in the center, and I hope that we will have a really a, a political agreement, a political commitment at the Porto Summit uh, that we have to to implement those uh, twenty principles and rights into reality, into tangible results. But it's also the process. It's also the process, and I think we have to reinforce social dialogue and the involvement of social partners and of civil society and organized civil society, which is here in the economic and, and social uh, committee. I think only if we have all the stakeholders on board, then this can fly. And just to mention one, uh, one sentence, we are talking about the challenges of digitalization and of the Green Deal. And we all say the Green Deal must be a social deal. But the precondition for this is that all the stakeholders on board, which means for me as trade unionists and as workers group, that the workers must be on board, they must have a voice. So we have to make sure that also the framework, the legal framework for the involvement and for the participation of workers and workers' representatives have to be fit for purpose. Thank you. And there's a lot of questions actually about the legal framework. Commissioner, I'll come back to you on that a bit later on. But uh, staying with the broad principle at the moment, uh, Irache, for you, a, a social contract, what does that mean to you? You emphasise the importance of concrete action. What is this yes. new social contract? Yes, because we always speak about the social model and we are very proud with this social model. But we need to understand that during the time the, the the, a lot of changes happen, and uh, we need to reintroduce this social dimension in our lives. No, uh, what? Uh, how is possible to introduce that? Of course, we have the uh, short uh, measures, a uh, medium term, and in long term. We are speaking in the long term, uh, but uh, we we have to to know that uh, in this pandemic uh, uh, situation, uh, as you know. Uh, the, the European uh, institution decide to suspend the fiscal rules. And during this time, it is so important for us, for the European institution, for the parliament, uh, of course, the council, the commission, but the civil society to open a great debate to understand uh, how can we introduce, for example, the golden rule with the social investment. I know that it's a very difficult debate in this moment, but we need to start to introduce this uh, discussion uh, in, in our uh, in the different levels because uh, we cannot repeat the the same austerity uh, policy that in the past. If we remember the last uh, crisis, the economic crisis in two thousand eight, the the uh, we decide uh, to to introduce the austerity in our lives. And now we are paying the, the effects. Uh, it's so important to introduce this idea, no? Uh, the golden rules with the social investment. Uh, how can we support the reinforce of the, our public sectors in the member states? Uh, education, healthcare, uh, social rights, of course, because we are speaking about the poverty, for example, we are speaking about the jobs and employment. All these things, it's so important to understand that uh, uh, 
uh, we need to have a, a plan with this concrete action. No, okay, we can start now with uh, different uh, measures with the different uh, tools uh, like uh, child poverty, minimum wage, uh, jobs and employment, but in the long term, we have to understand that it's necessary to introduce this idea about how can we support the member state to uh, reinforce the social investment in a social uh, policy, uh, because only in this way we can guarantee that uh, the social dimension will have a strong uh, position in our policies and we can maintain and keep our social model. I want to come back on that question of investment uh, of public finances and how they can best be used a little bit later on. Uh, but Commissioner, uh, you welcomed uh, this call for a new social contract. For you in concrete terms, what does that really mean? Uh, and when we look, you know, we're talking a lot about a just transition. Do you agree the um, European Economic and Social Committee in an exploratory opinion on the industrial transition in December said uh, that it was absolutely vital. Uh, you couldn't have a beneficial green deal for all without this new social deal. Do you agree with that analysis? Yeah, certainly I agree. But just to, uh, to give four points on what I think which are essential elements of this uh, social contract. The, fair, the first would be a fair distribution of wealth. And this starts with uh, wages. We have had a relative stagnation of wages, especially when we compare wages to other income forms. We have had a financial fin financialization of our economy. Uh, stock markets explode and wages, wages remain stagnant. So I think we have to restore a fair distribution. That means, by the way, the idea of fair minimum wages, but it means, above all, I would say, again, strengthening collective bargaining. This is an imbalance we have to restore. My second point, and it has already been mentioned by Irache, that's uh, investment, social investment. Uh, we have gone through a period of austerity, budgetary austerity, and uh, we have impoverished our social services. And we know, we see it now, especially as our health services are very much under stress. We see that those who are the frontline workers, the nurses and other workers in this crisis, they are underpaid and, uh, and uh, they have not been, uh, there's not enough stuff here to respond to this crisis. So, so to restore the value of social investment, education being another important. The third point is equal opportunities. Uh, we have more and more uh, a society where there are no equal opportunities. Poverty of children, that's why it's so important to launch this child guarantee, to give all the children equal opportunities, at least better opportunities. So this is an important, and my fourth point, that's uh, democr democracy, that's uh, uh, social dialogue. We have to switch from uh, the shareholders economy to a stakeholder economy again. Well, this is not something absolutely radical because when I listen to what is discussed now in Davos, now, precisely now, that's people say, well, we have come to the limit of this system and we have to change something in the system and we have to, to really emphasize the role of all the stakeholders, civil society being one, but especially social partners being at the forefront. And this is uh, what this uh, new social contract is, in my view at least, all about. Thank you very much indeed. Miguel Cabrita, from your perspective, Commissioner, they're very clear on, on what it means. Would you agree with those four elements that he's identified? Is there anything else you would add in terms of the key ingredients to really begin, as Irache called for earlier, to deliver the concrete action you all have underlined is so important? Yes, I think I agree with pretty much everything that has been said. Uh, when, when you talk about a new social contract, you are necessarily talking about the broad uh, approach and the broad number of issues that can bring us together as a society and, again, focus on the, on the long term. And what, when, when you think about of a social contract and such a broad concept, uh, I think we are talking about the content, the issues that matter, 
you are talking about the process, the institutions and the processes that lead and that materialize that social contract. And you are also talking about a strategy and a vision for, for the future. And when we look at the current crisis, we see that, of course, it brought new issues and mainly uh, it has exposed health issues that are now on the front line of our concerns. But it, the, the, the crisis has, has also highlighted what I think are very long-standing pressures on our societies. Um, globalization, individualization of uh, labor relations and social flexibility in labor markets are now more than ever exposed as key issues that we must discuss and, and address. So I would say that you need to have to talk about a new social contract, you need to have uh, a number of principles that are translated uh, into content, into specific initiatives. I'd say uh, social cohesion and what Commissioner Schmidt said about income distribution and salaries is uh, of utmost importance. Uh, also, the, qual uh, the quality of our jobs that matters immensely to people and families of all generations, not only young people, but also uh, young people. Um, we need to talk about social inclusion, tackling poverty, looking at the lower end of income distribution and uh, where exclusion really is a, a risk in daily lives. It's, uh, issues oh. of justice and fairness. And there, again, I agree that education and skills throughout life, the so-called lifelong learning, is a, a, a very important matter because it touches both individual opportunities but also competitiveness of companies and our countries as a whole in the and then of course you need to have equality um, for instance equality between men and women but also other forms of inequalities and 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 discrimination and of course social dialogue uh, as the basis for any contract and so uh, of course also for social contracts i think that structurally uh, we all the, the way out of this crisis and the recovery we want and the vision of the future society we, we aim for europe um, is a long and winding road and it needs to have two legs one of them is recovery of course and economic growth but you need to have resilience and sustainability and for that the social dimension and the social contract that Commissioner Schmidt has mentioned is really, really very important. And every instrument we put on the table to uh, make that a reality will be uh, an important contribution for Europe and for its citizens. Thank you very much. Irache, um, would you add anything in terms of you were making that plea? We now need it to be very concrete. Uh, what would you, would you add anything to what the Commissioner and the Secretary of State have said? Yes, I want to introduce uh, one idea because, of course, the new social contract must be more inclusive and we need to, to, to uh, open this uh, process. And in this moment, we are trying to unblock the Conference of Future of Europe. And this conference uh, can be a good, uh, extraordinary opportunity to introduce uh, this uh, idea uh, this uh, debate with the different proposals. The Conference of Future of Europe needs to reopen a great debate with all civil society, with the trade unions, of course, uh, workers' group, but uh, with NGOs, uh, with the uh, young organization. We need to open this extraordinary debate about the future of Europe. And in the future of Europe, a great... Uh, uh, flag have to be this uh, uh, social contract. No, I think that is a good opportunity because everybody uh, is uh, now expecting about uh, Europe. Uh, with the COVID crisis, uh, uh, now open a different discussions about how can Europe must to be advanced. No, for example, with the health union, it's other important issue with the healthcare. All these issues need to be discuss uh, between the European institution, but it cannot be in the bubble Brussels. It has to open this debate with the national parliament, with the civil society, with the civil organization. And I think that can be a good opportunity to speak about this uh, social contract. 
Thank you. And just to complete the picture, and then I want to come uh, back on this question of the involvement, uh, of worker involvement, of civil society involvement. But Oliver, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee has produced uh, opinions on issues, uh, many of the issues that are mentioned relating to fair minimum wages, relating to income protection, relating to unemployment uh, insurance uh, and so on. What for you are the key ingredients in concrete terms? So we're talking content now, we'll come back to process shortly, but for you, the most important elements of this new social contract. You're muted, Oliver. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> As it was said, already mentioned by, by the other speakers, I um, agree very much um, with the point uh, that we need social coherence and social convergence and that we need to fight poverty. And I can see it also in the chat that this is really something uh, which is important for people, which is tangible for people. And what can we do in order to fight poverty? Of course, some of the answers were already given uh, to increase wages, to have decent minimum wages across Europe and to reduce and to, to actually to end business models which basis on low wages and not on decent wages. So, but on the other hand, I think, and you mentioned it, it's also important to make our social protection systems sustainable, strong and reliable. And uh, I, I think we have to do something in this respect. Uh, I know that this is mostly in the competence of member states. This is really difficult. But I know that the Commission uh, made already some efforts in order to coordinate uh, those protection systems. and. If you ask me for concrete proposals, we made, for example, the proposal uh, that in the field of unemployment insurances, uh, Europe should play a role in this. Uh, Europe should play a role in this in order to set minimum standards, not in order to harmonize different systems, which are very different from country to country, but to set minimum standards, common minimum standards with regards to the net replacement rate, for example, with regards to the duration period of unemployment benefits for people, or with regards to active labor market policy to bring people uh, back into employment. This is important. And we as committee, we propose that we could have a gradual approach. We could start with a strong benchmarking system, but I would say also then in the longer term with binding um, um, binding regulations or binding directives at European level. So I think this is, uh, we can't avoid this if we want to have more uh, social convergence. And I think this is actually the, the goal for us to have economic convergence and social convergence. It has to go hand in hand. Hand in hand. Thank you very much. Let's just pick up on some of those points uh, about poverty. Um, and a couple of clear questions, I think, come to the Commissioner first on this one. If poverty is clearly a challenge, says the questioner, can we say that the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan will include a European strategy to fight poverty with clear and ambitious targets, uh, as Oliver said. Uh, we must remember, says the questioner, that we had a target in the 2020 European strategy that wasn't achieved. What will be done now? Also, question poverty has a strong territorial dimension. How will the action plan address this and incorporate a place-based approach to territorial inequalities. And more broadly, Commissioner, if you could pick up on that point about poverty, but there are a couple of questions here about the kind of legal initiatives uh, that need to be taken in order to make implementation of the pillar effective in all member states. What will be the legal character of the pillar after the summit? So quite a lot of emphasis here on the legal framework of all of this. Could you pick up on both those points, Commissioners, and same questions to you all? Commissioner first. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, for the poverty issue. Uh, it's absolutely true that the uh, objective, uh, uh, the 2010, 2020 objective of reducing the number of, uh, uh, of uh, people at risk of poverty, uh, which was at uh, 20 million, was not achieved. And, and there is now, uh, a worsening of the situation largely due to uh, the COVID uh, uh, crisis. So this uh, emphasizes the importance of uh, uh, fighting poverty. But targets are important. But what is more important are the instruments, the policies you, you use. And I think here we have to work on the policies. Some of them have already been mentioned. First, a good job. 
because we have an inward poverty which increases because wages are low, because people are part-time, they cannot find a full-time job, so they work and they are poor at the same time. 30 million people probably now are considered to be, to be affected by in-work poverty. So we have to rebuild the world of work with fairness, with good wages. That's the first solution against poverty. The second one is equal opportunities. This affects children uh, working on the child guarantee. Uh, this is uh, very important because this is the, the poor of the future. We are producing, reproducing poor people to uh, the, the poverty of children. The third are women. Women, because we notice that a lot of women are excluded. So gender equality is the right way to fight poverty. The fourth are the most vulnerable people in our society. We have to deal with this. These are instruments we need. These are the people with the uh, disability. These are minorities like the Roma and so on. These are all the migrants. So we have to target these groups of people and work with them to integrate them into society, to get them a good job, to give them equal opportunities. So I insist very much on the tool. We have to have a comprehensive approach to fight poverty. I've forgotten the, the issue of uh, minimum income. This is yeah, the, we have a issue we have. questions about minimum income, minimum yeah, wages. Yeah. Will you no. propose a directive? People are asking, is it feasible to talk about minimum wages for the whole of the EU? A couple of questions on that. Well, we, we do not talk about one minimum wage for the EU. The, the, the social convergence does not mean that we are equalizing everything in Europe. This is not possible. It's not even really uh, uh, what, we, what we wish. But uh, we have to have a tendency to more uh, harmonization to come together uh, as uh, economically, but also socially. That's what uh, the uh, proposal of the Commission on Minimum Wages is about. And the same thing is for minimum income. It's not possible that, it, that in uh, some member states there are no real structures for minimum income, that people are in absolute poverty. So we have to have progress on all these issues. And this makes a strategy to fight poverty. This is a strategy to restore opportunity, better equal opportunities in Europe. So this is what I, uh, the action plan will be about. Uh, it's not one tool, not one. We have a general objective and we have a, a, a number of tools. Now on the legal side, well, the, the, uh, the pillar of social rights is not uh, purely a legal document. It's a political document, it's a political commitment. It's in a way a framework in which uh, Europe has to, uh, to develop uh, its policies. And the action plan will, as uh, Yerache has said, translate these principles now into concrete actions. Some of them need legal uh, initiatives. Some of them need legal initiatives. The minimum wage is one, I think we will have to have a legal instrument for the platform workers. We will have legal instruments for an, many other issues. But a lot depends also on the policies in the member states, which uh, still have a, a big uh, responsibility because social is not a, a EU competence, a unique unit, uh, EU competence. We share that with the member states but also uh, between social partners. I, I would like to, uh, to have a more active role for social partners. We had a big discussion last week on the, the right to disconnect. Well, uh, maybe there is a need for some kind of a legal framework at European level, because I do not want that some workers in some member states have the right to disconnect, and many other workers in, an, uh, in part of the member states do not have this right. Why? This is not convergence. We need some convergence on this. But at the same time, there are a lot of different situations. So social partners have in this kind of issues a very important role to play. So there is a room for legal uh, frameworks, for legal uh, initiatives, but there is a very large role, uh, room for uh, uh, policy initiatives. And here also social partners and the, the Commission can play an important role by coordinating and by pushing it to the right action 
of more convergence. Thank you very much. Uh, Miguel Cabrita, coming to you on this, would you agree this mix we need of the policies and the legal instruments, please do react to what the Commissioner has said. And there's a sort of a political question here, if you like, from the audience. Facing so deep a crisis due to the pandemic situation, what does the Portuguese government think we should do to convince other member states to implement the pillar of social rights or, or some of its relevant steps? So how do you get broaden that question a bit, that political impetus, uh, taking on board what Irache said about it needs to be concrete, we don't just want another Gothenburg, a restatement of principles, we want action, but how do you get that political impetus? Do you think it's going to be a challenge to go from member states expressing a commitment to it to actually agreeing some of these steps that the Commission is talking about? Well, it's it's always a challenge. That's why we are 27 member states with different political views, different histories, different backgrounds. But oh, and we we, all, we are all familiar with that and with the diversity of, of positions. But I, I fully agree that there is this uh, this two tire approach. Uh, of course, we have the all the legal framework and the concrete instruments, and they are very important from the political point of view, because they put pressure on member states and they put pressure, in fact, on all of us uh, to implement and to, con to have concrete steps uh, in the directions that are uh, decided and agreed uh, in the Council and in other institutions. But, of course, there's a political dimension to all of this. And I think that the Porto, the Porto Summit is all... Um, uh, yeah. We are not going to have uh, just a discussion on principles. Our idea is that there is a concrete link with the implementation plan and the social pillar so that we have, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, I I'd say the social lag of this whole discussion about recovery, resilience, the instruments, the process. Uh, I think that uh, Portugal and many countries have in the past always fought between, for instance, the European know. social semester and the social agenda in, in Europe. And I think that in the face of the current crisis, this is a step and this is a pressure we need to keep on having. Um, I think that this is, the, this is a very difficult time for, for every country, a very challenging time, but it's also a good reason to look at the future. And what we feel from different member states and also from different players uh, in the European Social Committee and in other institutions, different interests and views about the labor market, about, about, uh, about Europe itself, is that uh, we are all converging on the need to send clear signals to our citizens, to our societies, and to rally behind uh, common goals and a common approach to issues that are truly structuring uh, of not only of our present but of our future. So, to, to go very briefly to your question, I think that in Porto uh, we will try to have um, as broad a consensus as we can. We will try to involve different elements and in different institutions and stakeholders. This is why, by the way, that we will uh, planning to we are planning to have a two days a two day uh, event. And one, of course, will be uh, uh, focused on the, the meeting of the heads of state and government, the, the, the council. But on the first day, we will have a high level conference to uh, include and foster the participation uh, of uh, different stakeholders from social partners to civil society, uh, because we really think that uh, we need instruments, uh, we need the legal political commitment of every stakeholder uh, from member states to the civil society and social partners. That will be our main goal. Uh, we know it will not be easy, uh, but uh, probably if it was easy, we wouldn't establish it as a goal. So uh, Absolutely. let's work together. And I'd like to come back on that stakeholder engagement later. I was particularly struck by uh, something Commissioner said earlier when he talked about shifting from a shareholder economy to a stakeholder economy. We'll come back on that in a moment. But Irache and Oliver, from your perspective, this description uh, that the Commissioner gave of this balance of legal instruments, of policies, underlining, of course, the importance of what happens at the national level. Come back on the funding. I don't want to forget the funding. There are some questions about that as well coming in. Irache, how do you see that balance? And, and what Miguel Cabrito is saying there about how we 
make this concrete at Porto? What for you is the key? Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with uh, the commissioner, with the Smith. I always agree with uh, Smith. <laughs> well, that's marvelous. <laughs> In any case, uh, no, uh, really, we have to, to, to find this balance no, between the legislative measures and with uh, other instruments. Because, for example, in the beginning of the term, uh, our group uh, introduced uh, the, um, the, the issue about uh, uh, to change the European semester. I was uh, listening Miguel Cabrita speak about uh, the European semester, and we introduced this uh, debate, and the European Commission accept to, to change the, the current European semester in order to introduce uh, uh, the social and environmental objectives and criteria. This is so important, because the European semester cannot be only an exam about uh, the fiscal measures about the economic situation in the different member states. We need to introduce other criteria, other uh, important uh, questions. Not the social dimension has to be in the head of the European semester. Uh, this is a, a legislative instrument, but if we speak about other measures, for example, I want to, to introduce an important topic with the uh, housing access. Because, okay, during the confinement, during the COVID uh, crisis, we ask the people to stay in home. What happened with all people who has not uh, ha access to housing? Uh, the, 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 the number is so important. We are speaking about 700,000 people in Europe without access to housing. For that reason, it's so important to speak, for example, about the housing strategy in, in Europe. Uh, now, uh, during this week, uh, the Socialist Group in the Committee of the Regions uh, organized a week for access to, to housing, and we are uh, working in some concrete measures. And for us as a group, it's so important, for example, to guarantee that in 2030, the 70% of these people who has not access to housing in this moment will have. That is so important. For example, we are speaking about the recovery plan. Why cannot be a good uh, instrument to introduce some measures in a different member state to guarantee the access to housing? We, we can uh, use this, uh, this uh, idea no, to, to advance and to open this uh, important uh, issue. For that reason, I think that it's possible to introduce a balance between the legislative, of course, minimum wages, uh, minimum income, uh, child guarantee, with other instruments uh, like uh, strategic plans uh, with other issues. Thank you very much. And Oliver, uh, in terms of that balance of tools and instruments, we're also getting uh, questions relating to monitoring. Uh, would, would, can we have a binding provision, says one questioner, for checking on timing and significant participation uh, of the social partners? Uh, and this questioner says, without such provision, the participation of social partners will stay limited, will lack real ownership. Uh, another questioner saying, can you say more about the concept of social progress plans as part of the recovery? plans uh, and so on. So for you, this balance of instruments and, and where are you on the targets question, on the indicators, how binding they should be or not? Yes, uh, I think as the other speaker said, I think we need uh, definitely a mixture of instruments. Huh? We need a mixture of instruments. What we cannot afford is that we stay with the European pillar social rights as a proclamation. So we have to make sure that there are really tangible results for working people, for the citizens in Europe. Therefore, we need, of course, legal uh, initiatives. And they were already mentioned. We have some on the table, minimum wages. I think we need also a legal framework on minimum income. And I mentioned uh, the other one uh, on the unemployment uh, benefits, where I think in the long term, we can also think about uh, common minimum requirements at European level. And at this point, I would also like to mention 
uh, that all those social investments, we should see them really as investments in the future and not only as costs. And uh, I remember that uh, the predecessor of Nikola Schmidt, uh, Laszlo Andor, presented a social investment package many years ago. And I think it is still it is still valid. It is still valid. And we have to build on this. I know that Nikola Schmidt is very committed to this, also to the idea of social economy. And uh, by, by the way, we have commissioned a study, a study on the macroeconomic effects of common minimum standards, for example, in the unemployment benefit schemes. And uh, the researcher found out that we can stabilize, that we can stabilize uh, our economies because it's an automatic stabilizer, of course. And we can, we can have a higher GDP, they said by 0.7%, uh, by introducing some binding uh, unemployment uh, minimum standards. This is only one example. The same is true for minimum wages, because we have to make sure that we have uh, enough purchase power for workers in order to, to uh, keep the economy going. So I agree, we need a, we need a mixture of instruments. And if it comes to the European semester, of course, the European semester is also central. We know that uh, from 2020 onwards, the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations are to be built into the uh, semester analysis. Therefore, we propose to equip the European semester with new measurable and complementary social and economic indicators to monitor and to keep track of all the aspects of the European pillar of social rights. And you said the social partners, I think yeah. their involvement and their monitoring is absolutely mandatory. Must Because you, you have talked in your explanatory opinion also about new governance structures. Uh, and I think you're focusing particularly on the company level, on the grassroots level, that involvement of workers in shaping this future, in meeting those big challenges, as we said, not just the short-term COVID challenges, but the transition challenges, the digital economy, the green economy. What sort of new governance do you think we need? And we've got a number of questions. I'd like to then come to the Commissioner and to the Secretary of State and then Irache about the engagement with civil society, because we have a question saying, how is the social summit to engage civil society, NGOs, communities across the EU, and in the implementation of the action plan you need them but they're not in the agenda uh, another comment a bit later on also about that engagement question uh, so lots of concern about um, how to engage so um, first Oliver to you what does this new governance you've been calling for look like and then Commissioner the role of civil society in implementation and to uh, Miguel Cabrita perhaps in terms of you mentioned that first day of the social summit um, how do you make sure they're included and somebody says well that first day day be open to the public we'll come back to that but Oliver first from the governance structures well, the governance structures I mean you, you mentioned the, again the, the green deal and I, I said it at the beginning that uh, from my point of view, we are talking now uh, uh, together, the EU and the, the UK, about the level playing field. I think we need a level playing field within Europe. And we see that the governance structures also within the companies in order to manage transitions are totally different from country to country. And uh, I think the existing legal framework is not fit for purpose anymore. I think we have some success stories and I think also I'm convinced that this is something which can, can bring employers and workers and civil society together. Because I think we should, we should agree that participation of all stakeholders at the Porto Summit, but also at enterprise level, is crucial in order to manage the change. We had an example in Valladolid. I was there with Irache. There was a problem with restructuring, huge problems with structural change and, and industrial change. And the result of this exercise was that all the stakeholders said we need more involvement and we need also more mandatory participation rights for workers and for workers' representatives. And I think here we have to do we have to do something. We need uh, this strong workers' voice. We know that participation rights, even at board level, um, have some positive impact, some positive impact on the governance. And I think we we can improve. The European framework for this, um, 
just another point uh, we have uh, we have a directive of european works councils which is a good one which is a good one but also this has to be developed we need to enforce it we need really to enforce it in in all member states i think there's a lot of there are a lot of things to do in order to have really an, a level playing field also in the in the field of workers' representation and, and governance. Thank you very much. Commissioner, uh, in, in, in these broad terms, so strengthening the, the workers' voice, we talked about uh, moving from a, stake, a shareholder economy to a stakeholder economy. What for you is the key and how do you see the role of civil society uh, in implementing the action plan? And there's also a question about employers uh, with somebody saying, if we are to have a genuine social contract, employers must also sign up. However, many are concerned, particularly in light of COVID, that's me adding that about the survival of their businesses and will be looking to reduce costs um so how can employers be persuaded to engage in this new social contract a thought on that if you would and so the broad issue of engagement and the specifics oliver was talking about there in terms of works councils uh workers involvement and same question to you then secretary of state commissioner first yes uh thank you I think this idea of the stakeholders uh, is, is, uh, is increasing its influence. Uh, we, we see that also with the Green Deal, by the way, that uh, first the companies are not uh, uh, just uh, responsible for making profit. So you remember this uh, famous phrase of uh, uh, Milton Friedman saying, well, the only uh, objective of a company is finally to make profit and to uh, to uh, make a, a maximum of profit for uh, for its shareholders. And I think we cannot, with this philosophy, we cannot really uh, cope with the challenges, the digital, but also the social challenges, and especially also the the climate and green challenges. So this is important, and therefore this idea of stakeholders is 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 advancing. The second one is uh, uh, the civil society. Yes, well, these are the stakeholders because civil society, these are the people living in a region affected by uh, pollution or affected uh, by the closure of a, of, a, of a company or a factory. So we have to, to in include this. And now the commission is working on this, what we call due diligence, extra financial criteria, and, and really building up uh, uh, the response, the new responsibilities, also of uh, of companies, uh, and this is this is a, a big change if we if we manage that. And uh, you you said that uh, civil society uh, uh, was not involved in 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 the preparation of. Uh, the that was what the questioner said, not me. A questioner says they no. don't. Yeah, this is not true because we launched a, a, a very broad consultation. We got a number of responses. I would have expected more, I say it very clearly, but we got a, a number of, uh, of uh, responses. We organized in practically all the member states, broad consultation inviting NGOs, social partners, governments, everybody together to discuss about the action plan, about the implementation of the social pillar and civil society will be also and here uh, the the, uh, the secretary of state could perhaps give uh, more details will be associated in uh, the overall meeting in porto because the first day will be social partners institutions uh, also uh, like uh, the economic and social council and uh, or committee and and uh, and civil society. We are drawing a lot from uh, NGOs, from civil society. Uh, the initiative on homelessness, uh, we are doing that with uh, uh, organizations from civil society. Uh, the whole poverty issue is in a permanent discussion with the social platform and other uh, civil society organizations. So I think we have already now at the level of the European government, a certain role, uh, not only for social partners, which is key, but also for civil society organizations. Thank and you. here I think the social uh, economic and social uh, committee has a role to play because you also have uh, part of the civil society integrated there. We have uh, also to uh, rely to 
the Committee of Regions, because I see there are also questions about the territory. And my last uh, comment is, yes, employers have to be uh, involved and employers have to accept also a certain number of things. Because now what are we doing? We are subsidizing, we are helping by a huge amount of money. And I do not question that. I agree with that. A lot of companies saving them, helping them, supporting them. Fine. But there has to be some kind of some kind of a counterpart. And this is also to change a bit the overall attitude uh, towards uh, the social issues, the uh, issue of uh, participation of workers, and so on. So this is the counterpart of the huge efforts uh, uh, member states, states, the European Union is doing uh, in this crisis. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. And there is a comment saying uh, from someone, I think possibly from, from your team saying, pointing out there were more than 1,000 replies to the consultation on the action plan that was organized in 2020. So you've received a lot of input. Um, could I just say, I don't know whether you can hear it, but my commune have chosen this moment uh, to prune the trees right outside my office window. So if there is a bit of background noise, I do apologize, uh, which is why I'm muting and I'm muting myself, but um, can't be avoided. Uh, Miguel Cabrita, coming to you, and, and you talked about the role of stakeholders in the Porto Summit that first day. Uh, there was a question about whether the public it will be open to the public. Will they be able to watch it, listen to it, participate in some form? But then if I could drill down also, and same question to you, Iraqi, to Oliver's point about workers, the workers' voice uh, in companies. He's calling for a strengthening of the Works Council's directives. What do you see needs to be done there? Same question to you, Iraqi, as well. Uh, so just a few notes on the, on the various points that have been made. In my view, uh, governance, is where you make sure that uh, process is not just about procedure, but uh, about actual voice and involvement of different uh, stakeholders. Uh, and so it's very important there that you have in, in every process, but also uh, concerning the social agenda and the European social pillar and the implementation uh, plan, uh, we have to have involvement and consultation and it has taken place. It has been a very strong process throughout Europe and different member states and also different institutions at the European level. But you also need to make sure that there is uh, real monitoring to which, of course, it's important that we have targets and goals. Uh, and I know that the European Commission will work on that. And from our view, from the view of the presidency, we will support uh, all the ambition that and weight that we can put behind these, these specific targets and goals uh, to help uh, the agenda uh, and the implementation plan to, to move forward. And we also need to find ways of co-steering throughout time. Uh, and so the involvement of different stakeholders, stakeholders over time will also be an important element uh, of the implementation plan and the, the whole social process at the European level. Of course, we, also, all, we already have uh, a number of significant uh, elements and uh, instances of dialogue and involvement of different stakeholders. Uh, we always support the, the strengthening. Um, um, during our presidency, in fact, we want to take a closer look at the future of social dialogue, uh, which again is something, and social dialogue specifically collective bargaining and dialogue uh, at the company and sectoral level. Again, it's not, it, this raises issues that are not new uh, have not emerged with the COVID crisis. They highlight pressures and trends that come from way back. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a very, very uh, topical issue right now with all the changes in the world of work, in companies, uh, in business models, in, uh, in how the world of work and companies uh, work. And we want to take a look at that in the EPSCO Council. We will promote a policy debate about the future of social dialogue and collective bargaining. About Porto specifically, I'd like to again highlight and underline for us the importance of the first day of the event. That's where we want to involve civil society and different stakeholders. Uh, for us, the ideal outcome uh, would be that uh, uh, after that high level conference, we could have a social commitment, a social compromise uh, in which different stakeholders would come together and support 
the overall direction uh, of the work that's being done and the goals and targets that are being uh, are being set about the participation of the public i am not sure the the event and the, the the actual format is already closed but anyway i know it will be a very participative uh, uh, forum uh, in which we as i say we want to have a very close relationship with the reflection and the discussion we will have in the second day there they're involving uh, the heads of state and government, and of course the European Commission. But as I say, uh, for for us, uh, governance is very important, and the, the involvement of stakeholders not only in the initial moments of the process, but throughout the process and throughout the years. Again, this is an agenda for the next decade. I think it's very important, and it's not only to the the implementation plan. I think that we we'll look, we need to look at social dialogue and specifically. In our presidency, we will try to look at collective bargaining at the company and central level. I think it's an important issue for the future of our societies. Thank you very much. Um, Irache, a comment to this. Uh, the uh, Economic and Social Committee, in their opinion, said you can't have a just transition if there isn't this very close worker involvement in designing the responses. Would you agree to that? And what do you think needs to be done? And then I want to touch on the social investment and funding issue with you all before we draw some conclusions because there's a question relating to that but you're actually first to the workers voice in all of this of course uh, and i totally agree and our group as the group in the european parliament uh, uh, have to be understand with uh, our uh, work with this uh, workers uh, voice no uh, without them it's totally impossible to do uh, our work, uh, our initiative, uh, our proposals, uh, because uh, as uh, I was uh, mentioned, uh, the report, for example, of the Strong Social Europe for a Just Transition, this work with a clear roadmap uh, uh, was uh, uh, coordinated with the trade unions, uh, with the uh, workers uh, group. Of course, uh, we cannot do that without them. Uh, for us as a group in the European Parliament is essential, this participation. And I have to tell you, for example, that uh, in order to guarantee and to coordinate uh, our action with the Porto Summit, uh, we uh, are organizing a steering group with the members of the uh, European Parliament in our group, with the trade unions, with the national governments, with the European Commission, it's so important to, to coordinate all voices. And uh, for us, the social dialogue is uh, essential. We cannot work without them. Thank you very much. Commissioner, uh, there's a specific question about public funds uh, and uh, investment, and but I'd like to broaden it out as well. The specific question, are there any particular funds earmarked for the implementation of the action plan at EU level, uh, in addition to all the various programmes that will support it, its single principle linked initiatives like the child guarantee, uh, especially, says the question, of something that can be accessed at the sub national level. And I'd like to also broaden that out because we don't have long in terms of how you see the role of next generation generation EU. So this recovery uh, fund, uh, you talked about recovery and resilience earlier on, um, how you see the role. Is there a place we talk a lot about investment in green in digital? What about investment in social through that channel as well? Comment to that if you would. Well, uh, first, uh, there's no uh, specific instrument now to finance uh, the implementation of the action plan. Because the action plan, that's, that's finally the, the social program for the next years, the, the decade to come. And the decade to come, we have financial instruments. First, we have the ESF Plus, uh, and, and certainly uh, the use of the money of the ESF Plus, be it uh, fighting poverty, supporting un uh, uh, the unemployed and, and helping people to integrate the labor market, investing a lot in skills these are issues which uh, we, these are objectives which can be financed by the esf plus so the esf plus is the i would say the direct instrument for the action but beyond and here i i come back to what the uh, said we have now uh 700 more or less 700 uh, billion euros 
in the uh, recovery and resilience fund. A lot of this money has to be used to, to enhance the digital transformation, 20% in principle, and the, and, the, and the green transformation. But when we are talking about digital and green transformation, we do not exclude the social aspect. This has to be integrated into this transformation. And, and uh, thanks to the uh, extraordinary good work of the uh, European Parliament, we have in the regulation a strong social dimension because uh, member states can use part of this money uh, to foster social investment, to increase, to improve. And uh, I give a good example of the Portuguese national plan, by the way, investing in education. For instance, modernizing education through the digital. This is social, this increases equal opportunities, and uh, it's also helping the digitalization of uh, society. So I think uh, uh, there are now resources available, ESF, recovery, but also InvestEU. We can here support uh, and uh, the idea of uh, social economy was, uh, was uh, recalled by uh, Oliver. Yes, helping social businesses, social enterprises, social services, by uh, uh, giving them uh, also uh, the funding they need. So this is a comprehensive approach. And I think for once, resources are not the major problem. The resources are there. Now we have to develop the right policies and the right political will to use them. Thank you, Irachi. I see you nodding there. You would agree. We have the resource is there. It's how we use it. Uh, thoughts on that and briefly from all of you, and then we'll uh, try and draw some conclusions before we close. Irache first. Yes, yes. Now I, I think that we are in an extraordinary opportunity to, to understand that uh, the social dimension can be a transversal uh, idea and a guarantee that uh, we can reinforce our public systems and uh, the social investment in the different member states. Because, of course, we are speaking about uh, sust uh, environmental sustainability, we are speaking about uh, di digitalization, but the social dimension can be included in these uh, criteria. I was speaking, for example, about housing. Now we have an extraordinary uh, opportunity, for example, to include in these uh, national plans uh, different measures to adapt the current uh, homes uh, with uh, the uh, environmental measures, but at, at the same level to include this social dimension. Because, for example, we didn't uh, spoke during this uh, uh, debate about uh, the energy poverty, but could be other uh, idea, no? Uh, uh, in this moment, the different member states are working in the national plans. And we as a parliament, uh, we have the opportunity to work with the European Commission uh, in order to study the different plans. And we are insisting a lot with our members that the social dimension have to be a clear criteria. We have a lot of resources in this moment. It's incredible because uh, uh, in the last crisis, uh, we decide with the austerity. And in this moment, it's totally opposite. With that, we have a lot of resources. But these resources have to be uh, used uh, to, to guarantee that the social dimension will be a great uh, opportunity. Thank you. Miguel Cabrita, then Oliver, and then I'd like to put you all on the spot uh, to try and chart the way forward from here. But on this question of investment, uh, Miguel, uh, and, and the use of public money, would you agree we have the money? It's how we're going to use it that's really going to matter. Yes, I fully agree, but I'd like to say that uh, for a start, it's very important that we have the money and we have the resources. And that's a clear difference uh, when we compare uh, the, the European response to our current crisis to what we have witnessed, sadly, um, more or less 10 years ago, with tragic consequences for, for many, con many countries and I think also for Europe as a whole. So now we have a different framework. Uh, we have changed our approach. I would say we have learned 
from from the past. Also, it's a different crisis with a, a different nature. But all of these factors have converged in having a different uh, fr a different framework in terms of resources. Now, um, I, I think it's, I, I agree with what has been said. Uh, uh, I think we need to have a clear link between the recovery and resilience strategies and plans with a social dimension. There will be no sustainable and no resilience uh, on the, at the economic, from the economic point of view if we, if we don't have a, a strong social sustainability uh, of our societies, our labor markets, if we are not prepared from the human and social point of view. Um, and that's something that we need to ensure. And this will also be one of the angles that we will try to focus on uh, from the point of view of our presidency and on the on the road to Porto and the European Social Summit is I think will be one of the strategic uh, ideas uh, with a close link to the European pillar and the implementation plan. Also, I would like to say just to conclude very briefly that we, of course, next generation and the resilience and recovery funds are very important. But uh, Commissioner Schmidt has said something very important the role of the European Social Fund and ESF Plus, because the crisis uh, will pass, this generation of funds and programs will pass, but the European Social Fund has been here for decades, and it's truly important for the European project, for European citizens, and specifically for countries and territories that are more disadvantaged. So this is, uh, we should not be, I'd say, blinded by the amount of resources that are now available for recovery and resilience. They are very important and very strategic. But in the long term, on, in, uh, at, on the long term, uh, we should not forget that the European Social Fund is in fact part of our, I would say, um, institutional and collective infrastructure, and we must battle for a good use of the ESF+. Plus. Thank you. And a comment here, which really links back from our audience, which links back to your point at the beginning about tackling immediate issues and long term future. The pandemic is provoking, says the uh, person from the audience, a huge social crisis in many EU states, Portugal included. Where are the funds? And you're answering this to help fight states to fight poverty and inequalities in this right moment before Porto. We need help now. So that urgency and somebody else saying, putting it the stakes very high, social emergency emergency should be treated on the same level of priority with the sanitary emergency. Otherwise, says the commenter, it is possible that the EU will no longer exist. So uh, I don't know whether you see it in such apocalyptic terms at this point, but I want to ask each of you by way of conclusion on this last question. I will start with Irache, then I'll go to uh, Miguel Cabrita, then to the Commissioner, and I'd like to give Oliver the last word. Um, Oliver said earlier uh, that this is a window of opportunity and you've all talked about the social dimension was there before COVID. COVID has underlined just how important it is. Commissioner talked about seizing the opportunity to change the mindset. And for each of you, therefore, I wanted to ask in a minute each, Irate, this is an impossible question, but as we look to the action plan, we look to the social summit of all the issues that we've discussed over the last hour and a half. What for you is the key next step that needs to be taken through the plan, through the summit, in order to really deliver that concrete action that you called for right at the outset? Same question to you all. Irache first. It's essential to adopt this roadmap with the clear criteria, with the clear legislative and non-legislative measures with budget, of course. We need to have uh, the picture about how can we advance in this uh, new social contract. And it's possible to do that. We have uh, uh, some uh, time now to, to, to debate, to discuss, to exchange a different point of view. And this Porto Summit can be the opportunity to finish with a roadmap, with a short, medium and long-term measures, with budget, and of course, uh, with uh, the different responsibilities in the institutions, so civil society, trade unions, the workers' voice, of course, is essential. We can do that and we will work during the next time for this. Thank you. And Miguel Cabrita, you have an enormous task on your hands. Both we've talked about process, we've talked about content in terms of delivering uh, on the pillar, uh, delivering a Porto 2030 agenda. For you, at the end of the presidency, what will make you say, yes, we really did deliver a significant moment on this journey? 
Yeah, we have an enormous burden, but let, let me share it with the commissioner and with all the rest of, of our our participants today. But yes, I, I understand your question. Uh, well, for us, it would be a, a, a huge success, but above all, uh, a very important signal for the future that we could all rally behind uh, not only the principles of the social pillar, pillar, but also the implementation plan and with different elements aligned. Uh, we it, it was tremendous work from the Commission and I think a collective work to have the the the, the European pillar as it as it is right now with all the principles. Uh, but now uh, we are working and the Commission is working on developing and delivering specific instruments to the different dimensions of the of the pillar, uh, working on targets and goals, and uh, of course uh, having the right resources. Um, also policy resources, but financial resources as well to support the, the initiatives. That Thank with the involvement of all stakeholders, I think would be um, a, a very a good outcome for the presidency, sure. Thank you so much. Commissioner, I won't ask you to pick from the many elements that will be in the action plan, but maybe it's easier to say, what do you hope for out of Porto to really drive this process? What is your key next step? Well, I, I, uh, I think that this crisis, and, and especially the pandemic, has created in our societies, in all the member states, a lot of anxieties, a lot of concerns. Citizens asking, well, what about my health, but also about my job, about my company, and so on. And here, I think we have to give a strong response, that we have a plan, that we want to build back better, that we have learned the lessons, and that finally the European social model is an enormous asset, and that we have to work on it. We have to strengthen it, we have to adapt it to the new challenges, and the, we have concrete solutions to do so. We have spoken about the money, this is key. We have to show that this money goes where it is needed, in the investments which are needed to the citizens, to, to respond to their to their concerns, and I think this is the political message which has to go uh, to go out uh, from Porto uh, to build confidence. Also, people are in a very difficult. Millions of people are in a very difficult situation, especially the young. This is also an important issue to give a strong message to the young that we will not forget them. That uh, they are going through not only economically, but even I would say psychologically, through a very difficult uh, period. So I think uh, Porto can be a very, very for Europe, for the European project, a very, very important moment. So we have to work on it together, all together, and I'm confident that we will uh, make uh, out of that uh, a success for not for us, but for whole Europe. Thank you very much for such an optimistic note uh, as we bring the proceedings to a close. Oliver, you have the last word, sir. Thanks a lot, uh, Jackie. Well, uh, I think from my point of view, if we could really achieve to have a strong commitment to, a, to an action plan which reflects the points we mentioned during this discussion, this would be a great result. I have to say in a nutshell, I would say the principle that additional efforts in social rights, in social Europe, additional efforts or investments in social protection will pay off in the end and will bring member states closer together and will avoid a further division within the European Union and within the member states. I think this would be an important uh, achievement of this, of this uh, summit. One point I haven't mentioned and I, I will just touch it. Uh, it's also the question, same wage, for the same work at the same workplace. I know we have rules in place, but we have to enforce it. We have to enforce it. And that's the same for all the social rights. People have to see that there are tangible results uh, from the European social agenda for them. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we will achieve something at the, at the Porto Summit. The ESC and especially the workers group is really ready to contribute. We made already some contributions. We will continue with this and we are happy to be uh, involved in this. And just let me 
as a last word also to thank, of course, all the participants, uh, our dis dis distinguished guests for this really uh, perfect and very good debate. But I would like to thank also my colleagues and friends from the Portuguese trade unions, from UGT and from CGTP. They are really great supporters uh, of the workers group. And uh, I think they bring also together the, uh, the Portuguese presidency uh, with us, with the workers group. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you to you and your team for putting together today's event, for hosting such an interesting discussion. Uh, the audience can't thank you, panel, uh, in the traditional honour, so let me do it on their behalf for a great discussion. Uh, we wish you all the very best for the action plan uh, for Porto. Uh, lots of work to do, but as Miguel Crabbuter said, and as you've all emphasised, it's something everybody needs to do together, working together. Thank you to you uh, for your many questions and comments. I managed, I think, to squeeze almost all of them in, not quite, uh, in the time we had available. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for those comments and questions. This debate will continue as we see the action plan and as we move towards Porto. But it only remains for me to wish you a very pleasant, if chilly day, depending on where you're watching us from, but in much of Europe, a chilly day. Please do stay safe uh, and thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks a lot.